Well, good morning. Man, wasn't that good? It's kind of, kind of wimpy for Easter Sunday. Good morning. That's better. It's good to see you this morning. Don't encourage him, right? Don't encourage him. I had a donut. My wife is really funny. She'll watch the sermon. She'll say, you had a donut, didn't you? I did. And she's going to figure out when she watches this that I stole her luggage, too. She doesn't know that yet. <clears throat> so uh, if you've ever watched a football game and had your team score a last-minute touchdown and win, then you're not a Dolphin fan. <laughs> I say that out loud? I'm sorry. Is that too accurate? Is that why it hurts? It's painful, I know, I know, the poor Dolphin fans. I was a Dolphin fan for years and years and years and years, and then I just gave up, because they did that a long time ago. So anyway, how many of you are football fans in here? Any basketball fans in here? Cricket? I have a friend who's a cricket fan. I sat and watched cricket with him, and I said, what? If you, if you have nothing to do one day, I mean, axe throwing is a lot more fun to watch, for sure, right? We got... <laughs> Sorry, I had to pick on you, pick on you from the front row. But, uh, but the truth is that uh, I have no idea how to play cricket, but there's something awesome about football. So that movie is about Kurt Warner and how when they, the coach put him in, people didn't want him to, but he gave him a chance and they didn't know what was going to happen. And then all of a sudden, what happened? Awesome. Just awesome. Now, listen, we're very separated from Easter Sunday, the first Easter. And we've just kind of settled in. And some of us have focused on baskets today. And there's nothing wrong with baskets. They're not evil. And there's nothing wrong with bunnies. They're not evil. I mean, there might be some evil bunnies, but you know. So, so <laughs> they had teeth like this. Uh, uh, but anyway, so if you caught that reference, you're old, by the way. So <laughs> did you catch that reference? You did. It was a Monty Python reference, which is pretty bad. So, by the way, we had a snake out the door. I don't know if you saw, the kids were getting ready to leave, and a snake was right outside the door. And uh, my favorite wedding years ago, I did a wedding out in the country. And, uh, you know, in Cocoa, we never have com country weddings. Uh, anyway, yeah. So, shotgun shells as for the, the boutonnieres and, you know. So, uh, anyway, the, the, the bridal party comes down, and I'm looking in the back, and the bride and her dad stop. And I'm like, what is going on? And I'm looking, and the dad starts going like this. I'm like, what is going on? A snake had come and was keeping them. I don't know if it was a hint for the couple, but it was keeping them from coming to the front. So we could blame Satan for trying to, hopefully it was not Jesus trying to stop her. But anyway, that was amazing. So I'm watching from the front, and nobody else can see this because they're looking this way, and I'm looking that way, and I'm like, oh, no. So... Florida man bit by snake during wedding. That was coming. So anyway, so uh, a few months ago, my daughter got to go to Ireland and with her band. And listen to this. This is the coolest. Their band raised money and got to play in the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Dublin, Ireland. Yeah, it was awesome. So, so she was getting ready to go and she said... Uh, my suitcase is it's not big enough for this trip. I need a bigger suitcase. So, so I'm going to be father of the year. So I did what all great dads do. I get on Amazon. And I do research. We call it research. And I read up on all these different suitcases. And I found what I thought was a perfect suitcase. Had awesome reviews. So I get her this suitcase. She gets it. She says, this is a great suitcase. I'm so excited so she's got the suitcase. She goes to Ireland. She gets there. And what comes out of the chute is no longer a suitcase. It is her clothes hanging out of some plastic shell wrapped in this clear plastic junk. And she sends me a picture. My suitcase has exploded. I went from father of the year to loser all over, right? And I thought, oh, man. So I said, if they can buy you, I said, tell somebody to buy you a suitcase. I mean, they had adults on the trip. I said, so, you know, whatever they need to do. And they went, and I got a call 
a, a, a day or two later that went like this, I, and it wasn't a call. You know that kids don't actually call you anymore, right? I got a text with pictures, and it said, I've got the coolest, best suitcase now. And they bought her this titanium, <laughs> bomb-proof, <laughs> luggage cart-proof suitcase with movie doobie wheels, and it can go backwards, forwards, side. I think it carries itself through the airport, <laughs> sings to you, tells you what a great job you're doing packing. You know, I don't know what it does. But, but like the best suitcase ever. And I was so thankful for that because guess what? She needed a whole new, her suitcase exploded. And nothing teenagers like more than their clothes being outside of their suitcase, right? And so, so here I'm looking and I'm like, I, I was so grateful to the person who basically got her a whole new start. As we talk today about this idea of recreation, we're going to talk about different kind of cases and we're going to look at this different baggages that we carry around. And I, I brought a few and stole this from my wife. And um, we're going to look at them and we're going to look at how we go from carrying fear and carrying doubt to the freedom. See how cool? This is not her new suitcase. I wasn't allowed to bring it. Oh, you think that's a joke. You, you apparently have not raised teenagers. You know what Mark Twain said about teenagers? This has nothing to do with the sermon. Mark Twain said, when they turn... 12, or 13, when they turn 13, you take them in a barrel, you put them in a field, and you feed them through the hole. And when they turn 16, you plug the hole. That's Mark Twain. So anyway, so there you go. It has nothing to do with the sermon, but there you go. All right. So, we're already off the rails. There's the donut talking. So, we struggle with fear. We really struggle with fear. And for us, fear is, is a lot like this bag. And I did the, the water-themed bag because some of us don't like water. Water is one of the few things I'm not afraid of. I'm afraid of a lot of things, not snakes, obviously, since I went running after that thing. And uh, I'm afraid of snakes that bite me. I don't like snakes that bite me. But when I have a shovel, I'm the bravest snake person on earth, right? And uh, let, let me tell you how afraid of heights I am. Um, uh, when's the last hurricane? Like six months ago? And six months ago, a little plastic panel off of the side of my house blew onto my roof and got stuck in the gutter. And every time the wind blows, every once in a while I hear, doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo. And, and I look up there and I think, man, if I wasn't terrified to get on the roof, I would get that. And I even went to the point of taking the ladder and thinking, eh, it's not so bad, I can do it. And putting the ladder on the side of the house, getting up to the top and swinging my leg to the roof and going, you know, you got to get back on the ladder when you're done. Nope. And that was it. So every time the wind would blow, I'd hear, Bloop, and I'd go, hmm, too bad, it's staying there till the next hurricane. <laughs> but then my daughter-in-law's at the house, she hears it up on the roof, and she says, what is that? Like I had done that on purpose. I said, oh, it's a panel that got blown off, and I'm too much of a chicken to get up there and get it, so it's still there until somebody's brave enough to get it. Literally, I had barely finished the sentence. She goes out the second story window, grabs the panel, comes down and hands it to me like, dork. <laughs> right? Now, here's the thing about fear. And, and those of you who are afraid of, of whether it's snakes or heights, some of you are afraid of water, some of you are afraid of something that you shouldn't be afraid of, right? Right? The, the thing about fear so often is it paralyzes us and it grabs a hold of us. So I, I was trying to think of what fear is like and it's, it's kind of... Now you have to imagine that this is a lot bigger, but it's the only stake I had. Apparently, whoever made the tent that I had has been in three mile an hour breezes. <laughs> but, but too often it's like that big stake where we have tied something around us and our fear keeps us from doing what God's called us to do so often. And some of you got hurt at church, so you don't go to church anymore, and you're here today because somebody made you come. 
and they promised it would be short, and they would feed you afterwards. Or maybe you're afraid because of a relationship. Maybe you're afraid because you've been hurt. Maybe you're afraid of something happening in your life. Maybe you're afraid of the future. Maybe you're afraid what's the state of the world, what's going to happen. And because of your fear, you're being held back and you're not able to do what God wants you to do. And I want to show you today that that same idea is in the Easter story. So we're going to pick up on John chapter 20 and start in verse 1. And here it is. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene, and she's the one who had all the demons cast out of her, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter, that's the ADD disciple in my opinion. Peter is the brave one who said, I can do it. And when he saw Jesus walking on water, he's like, I want to do that. And I mean, that's very ADD. And he says, so he comes running and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, uh, loved and she said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, but that's not where she stops. We don't know where they've put him. She was so busy living in fear, even though just a few days earlier, Jesus said, I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again. And when it happened, she immediately jumped to worst case scenario and forgot everything she had learned. You ever jump to worst case scenario? You go to start your car, it makes a noise and you're already imagining tow trucks. Maybe you're like me and one day I went out to my car to get my computer. My computer wasn't there. I compare, carry my computer in my bag. And so I grew up in Miami. So I instantly go, somebody stole my computer. And then I asked my kids, did you take my computer? Did you mow my computer? One of these kids took my computer. I bet you somebody stole my computer. And then I went back to my office and guess what? That's right where I left it, right in my chair. Oh, never mind. You ever jump to worst case scenario as soon as something happens? We've never lost our keys. Other people have moved them. Last night on the way to church, I couldn't find my keys. I was so frustrated. I immediately thought of this and I thought, you've jumped to worst case scenario. I bet you your keys are right where you always put them, which seems weird, right? Like, Eric, if your keys are always where you put them, why weren't they there? Well, they were there. But I had thrown a towel on top of them that I wanted to take with me. And I didn't look under the towel. Because I'm an idiot. And so sometimes we jump to worst case scenarios. Listen, some of you, you get a cold and you instantly think, I got to die right now. You have a problem happen with a friend and you instantly jump to the worst thing. Fear will keep you from loving and caring about people because when you get scared, you don't act like yourself. Listen to what happens next. John 20, 11 to 14, a few verses later, by the way, in between these verses, Peter and John had gone in the tomb and believed. The Bible says they believed. So they went running back. They didn't know exactly what was going on, but they were like going back to the disciples to go, Jesus isn't there. And they saw good news. But she still didn't. Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she went, bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot, and they asked her, woman, why are you crying? By the way, husbands, do not call your wife woman unless you're an angel or Jesus. <laughs> you might see Jesus if you do, right? So don't, woman, <laughs> that's never a good start to a sentence. <laughs> That's one of those like TikTok videos where they show the husband in the in the uh, in the casket right after. Thank you for the help. I needed that. They said, "Woman, why are you crying? They have taken the Lord away," she said, "and I don't know where they've put him." And I love this. Listen to this. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize it was Jesus. Now, a couple things here. Number one is, I imagine that Jesus is like right behind her looking at the angels going. <laughs> By the way, Jesus, 75 pounds of perfumes and spices. You think she would have noticed. I mean, don't you have that relative that they hug you 
And like an hour later, you're like, wow, they wear a lot of cologne, right? You ever, everybody have that relative? Okay, if that relative's here, would you just point at them real... No, I'm just kidding. Okay, don't do that. So, so we all have... Tom, I'm not pointing at you. All right, what would you say? Your mother was that way? So, okay, so, so here's the deal. So here, I grew up in Miami. We're not going to go. Okay, so... <laughs> Oh, I had some good friends. All right, so here's the truth, though. Jesus is right behind her. She turns around. She's looking in the face of Jesus, and she's like, I don't know where he is. How did she miss that? Because that's what fear does. Some of you right now are so worried about what's next in the world that you're not even enjoying the person next to you. Some of you, you ready for this? This one's going to hurt. Buckle up. Some of you in the car are so worried about what the other drivers are doing that the people in your car hear more yelling than they hear caring. Because we're more concerned about what the people around us are doing than the people we love that are in the car. Fear will keep you from relationships. It'll keep you from loving people. It'll keep you from caring about the people around you. And most of our fear comes from things that happened to us in the past. Some of you have been hurt in the past, and you're carrying that today, so you can't love the people around you. That's why forgiveness is such a big deal. You have to forgive people who've hurt you because you can't love the people you're with if you don't forgive them. I love what Rick Warren says here. We are products of our past, but we don't have to be prisoners of it. Number two, so not only do we struggle with fear, but Jesus brings new life. And so I'm doing it a little bit out of order. We're going to talk about the Jesus bag here. So what does Jesus do? He brings new life. In Galatians 5.1, it says, Jesus set us free. So if you have fear that's tying you up, Jesus is going to do better than these shears. You notice the older you get, the longer your body hurts. When you were young, when you fall off a tree... From 20 feet, get up and go on your day. Now you get out of bed and trip over a shoe, and your back's out for three weeks, right? The older we get, and here's the thing, Jesus brings new life. And just the same way that sometimes we're like, oh, I'm so tired. Sometimes emotionally and even spiritually, we're dealing with so much fear and so much doubt, and we've not said, God, I need you. I want to show you something really cool in this. On the evening, verse 19 and 20, on the evening of the first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Why would he have to say that first? If anybody suddenly appeared on this stage, I don't care if it's Barney Fife, we would all freak out. So one of the best things for that person to say was, I'm not going to hurt you. So Jesus comes and says, peace be with you. And then it says this, After he said this, what did he do? He showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Imagine their joy. Now, a minute ago we watched a little football scene, and many of you said you're football fans. And many of you who are football fans, unless you're a Dolphin fan, you've seen a last-minute touchdown that won the game. Sorry, Suzanne. It hasn't happened in a long time. It's been so sad. And so remember how excited you were and you gave your friends a high five. So we're going to be a crazy church for about a second. Don't worry. And I want you to act out the excitement if your team got the last minute touchdown. You ready? One, two, three. I got the wave in the back. You didn't even see it. That was awesome. I mean, it was a one person wave, but you know, it's good. Nobody, 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 nobody. Me. Okay. Next is the... No, I'm just kidding. All right. 
imagine how awesome it was for the disciples who were hiding. They had heard Jesus was alive, and then all of a sudden, he's there. So then what happens? Thomas comes, and Thomas is told for a week, for a week, Thomas is told, Jesus is alive, and Thomas is like, no, he's not. And all his buddies are like, no, no, really, he was here, and he showed us his side, and he showed us his hands. And Thomas is like, listen, unless I poke, which is pretty graphic, really, unless I get to poke his hands and poke his side, I'm not going to believe it. So what is Thomas saying? Unless God gives me what I want, I am not going to believe it. Unless my expectations are fulfilled, Unless I get what I want, when I want, I'm not going to believe it. So let's pick up with this whole idea of entitlement and this whole thing of I'm going to get what I want and this whole cynicism. I mean, mean, all of his friends are saying, no, no, really, he was here. (laughs) Come on. I mean, when you meet Thomas in heaven, you're going to be like, oh, you're doubting Thomas. And he'll be like, that's one time. (laughs) Right? So a week later, so a whole week goes by, seven days. Thomas, really, he was here. Yeah, yeah, whatever, guys. And Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came, stood among them, and said, Peace be with you. (laughs) I love this. Then he looks at Thomas, and he says, Put your fingers here, see my hands. Reach your hand out, put it in my side. Like, I heard what you said, dude. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who've not seen and yet believe. So here's the thing. In your life, there's a lot of things that seem like a big deal when you're far from God. And when you're far from God, there's a lot of things that you think, I am not going to be able to make it through this without these things, but... When you see the presence of Christ, what was a big deal at one time is no longer a big deal. See, Thomas thought, well, what I need is to touch his side. But when Jesus showed up, Thomas said, you know what I need? His presence. Too many times we're worried about so many things in our doubt, in our confusion. We're worried about money. We're worried about bills. We're worried about the future. We're worried about our health. We're worried about time. We're worried about our friends. We're worried about that family member. And when, instead, we take time to get into the presence of Jesus, to recognize, God, I know you're real, and I just want to know that you're here. And when we really acknowledge that he's here, you know what happens? Those things that seem so important aren't so important. He cuts those bands. He deals with our doubt. Let me show you what doubt is like. This is my doubt bag. I want to thank Publix. This is what doubt's like. Now, if you ever watch the gong show, you're showing your age. Doubt's like this plastic paper bag we put over our heads. See, when you're walking in doubt, it's hard to see what really matters because you're walking around worried about so many things. But when God shows up, He cuts that doubt out of the way. He helps you to recognize that He's there with you. So many of you think you need God to do a certain thing for you when what you really need is, God, I just need to know that you're with me. One of the things Jesus said to His disciples is, I will never leave you or forsake you. If you want to be able to cut the fear in your life, begin recognizing, God, you said you wouldn't leave me. I don't feel like you're near right now. But by faith, I know that you are. Maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. You know about Him. You understand Him. But you walk around with a bag on your head. You're always doubting everything in life. Or maybe like the fearful person that couldn't even see Jesus when He was next to them. You walk around 
fearing everything. Maybe today's the day you surrender to him. Listen to this verse. John 3.16 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son to the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. See, when I was in high school, senior in high school, I had gone to church all my life. I did religious things, but the truth was I didn't care about God. I mean, I would tell you I did, but the truth was, my heart, when I was in church, you know what I was thinking about? Girls. About 94% of the time. Bacon, the other 6%. By the way, someone brought me bacon this morning. They're now my favorite person. <laughs> cooked bacon. I should say cooked bacon. I didn't eat raw. And the truth is, I was going to church, and yet my heart was far from God. I was pursuing everything but God. So as a senior in high school, I finally said, you know, I don't know if I'm a Christian. So today, God, I choose to give my life to you. I don't even know if I ever have. But Lord, whatever it is at this point, I want to surrender my life to you, knowing that you died for my sins and rose again. Today, I want to start a new commitment to you, and I surrender my life to you. Now, I can tell you, looking back, that that day, God cut the bonds of fear in my life. That day, all the doubt was torn apart. Some of you are still walking in that. And you're a believer. I want to encourage you. Recognize God's presence. Let Him bring a new creation in your life and cut off all those old ways of thinking. If you're here today and you want to give your life to Christ, I'd love to talk to you after the service. We can pray together. Before you leave here, you can say, I've given my life to Christ today. Thanks for being here on this Easter Sunday. My prayer for you is you wouldn't have to deal with any kind of old garbage bag. But you could have a brand new creation from Christ today. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word, your power, your strength, your love. Father, I pray for anyone here today who doesn't know you that today would be the day they surrender their lives and their heart to you. Lord, I pray for that one that's walking in fear. They're having a hard time not only seeing you, but just even enjoying life. I pray today that you would release them, give them new life that you promised. Father, I pray for that one today who maybe doubt is discouraging them. Lord, I pray right now that you, with your presence, would overcome doubt in their lives and their heart. Thank you for these moments together. In Jesus' name, amen.